Father in heaven, we, man, glory, glory, hallelujah, we just stand in awe today of your goodness, of your majesty. Father, there is so much good news flowing down Mount Zion, and it's just nourishing us. It's satiating us. We just, oh Lord, I, I can speak for everyone because I know the quality of material and the spirit that's been here. Lord, we are basking in your radiant glory. Uh, this is an experience, and I've met so many people this year, Lord, who are here for the first time, and they're like, this will become an annual event for us. And Father, it just reminds us of those, those old feasts that that, that the Jewish nation, they would just come apart just to meditate and think on the goodness of Yahweh. Father, we're doing that. And our souls are being refreshed. Our hearts are being encouraged. Father, our toes at times are being stepped on. We get that. But Father, we're, we're happy to have our toes stepped on by the gospel. Father, you intend only good for us. And now as we turn our attention to the ecclesiastical trajectory of reform, I pray, Lord, that this will not be so high-minded that it's no earthly good, that you will take this seemingly uh, academic title and you will just distill it down and that it will land right in our lap. Be with me, Father. Give me words to speak that will bring glory to you, that will be characterized by clarity and charity is my prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. amen. On January 5th, 1527, listen to that date, 1527, just 10 years after Luther's protest at the Diet at Worms, just 10 years later, a group of people assembled in the fish market in Zurich. The group was led by Ulrich Zwingli, one of the best known and most loved Protestant reformers. In fact, just last night in Ty's presentation, there was a marvelous, fantastic, magnanimous quotation from the very same Ulrich Zwingli that we're talking about. He was leading a group, and they were on the borders of the Limat River. And there was a young man by the name of Felix Montz, 29 years old, Zwingli himself, just 41 at the time. But there was a strange sort of feel about the meeting because there was a solemnity in the crowd, a solemnity in the gathering as they stood there in the fish market, and then the strangest of things happened. This Felix Mentz was taken and tied to a pole, a large tree. And that large tree was then, you know, with, with, with great difficulty and, and with, with, you know, it was cumbersome, they placed this tree in a rowboat, this pole in a rowboat. And there were four or five strong men that rowed this boat out into the deepest part of the Lamat River. And then Felix Mance was given one last opportunity to repent. And when he refused, he was pushed overboard where the pole and he went down to the bottom of the river and he drowned. He was the first Protestant to be killed as a martyr by other Protestants. And what was his sin? Well, the sin is contained uh, sort of embryonically in the punishment. He advocated, are you ready for this? Rebaptism. Rebaptism. The idea that, that infant baptism, the idea that you become a citizen of Christendom was not sufficient. He advocated what Anabaptists would later call believer's baptism. I believe, and for this heresy, he was baptized into death by Protestants. Now, with that in mind, we're going to set the stage for the ecclesiastical trajectory of reform. Let me sort of wrap some less academic language around that. What we're trying to do in Ty's presentation this morning, my presentation, and then James's presentation after this is show as the title suggests, 500, the Reformation, what's that next word there? Continues. That's the title of our convocation. The Reformation continues. The question we're asking is, if the Reformation is continuing, doctrinally, what does that look like? And prophetically, what does a continued Reformation look like? And today, my task is to say, ecclesiastically, or what does a Reformed church look like? 
Not a church that's simply called the Reformed Church, not a church that sets up uh, its moorings around a reformer, whether Luther or Calvin or Wesley, but what would an ongoing Reformation look like? What would be the ecclesiastical trajectory of Reformation? We've mentioned before that it was comparably easy for the reformers to come out of Rome, it was a very different task to get Rome out of the reformers, right? To leave that thinking is a very different thing. This is a picture, a wood block carving of Felix Mance being rowed out into the deepest part of the Lamat River. Protestants killing Protestants. It seems like the idea is something like this. It's okay to persecute, it's okay to martyr, it's okay to coerce, it's okay to kill, you're just doing it on the wrong premise. You're doing it with the wrong foundation. You're doing it based on tradition, we'll do it based on scripture. Now that's only 1527, just, just a slight 10 years after Luther's protest at Worms. What about 2017? What would a reformed church look like in 2017? We're gonna look at four elements today. We're gonna to talk about the Constantinian shift, which I alluded to in my very first presentation, but we're gonna really sharpen that up this morning. We're gonna talk about the religion of human nature and we're gonna spend time in scripture, Luke chapter nine, mostly. Then we're gonna talk about control versus freedom and we're gonna cl close with a question, mighty movement or mere denominationalism? Okay, let's start with the Constantinian shift. You will recall perhaps this slide from my opening presentation. In fact, the opening presentation of, of the whole convocation this year, we talked about the four chapters of church history. The church was formed by Christ in the apostolic era. It was deformed through the medieval period. It, it reached such a nadir of darkness and superstition that reformation was inevitable and there were a variety of consequential factors that, that brought about that reformation. That reformation was incremental, it was cumulative, and then you have on a continuum, if you reform enough, if you keep reforming incrementally, right, a little bit at a time, if you keep doing that, you have a macro reformation, which I'm calling restoration. So these are not two different things. It's not like reformation and restoration. It's more like reformation, restoration, hyphen. And I put restoration up here to show that we're getting back on about the same line where the idea is a return to apostolic purity. Right, so that you're, you're on the same level. So the church is formed, deformed, as it reaches its bottom, its nadir, it comes up through an incremental process of reformation and will eventually arrive at something approximating or actually perhaps even exceeding the apostolic church. Why not? If the early reign can bring about the apostolic church, why would the latter reign bring about something less powerful? That's what we're talking about when we talk about restoration. So those are four possible chapters. And those are actually fairly consistent, by the way, with, with the language that, that many scholars use to describe the shape of church history. They don't use that language, formation, deformation, reformation, restoration. They use different language. They talk about the Antonicene period. They talk about the, the uh, period of the Christian Roman emperors. They talk about the uh, m uh, medieval period and then the modern period and then now the postmodern period. But there are another group of scholars that say, you know, all of that is sort of it's unnecessarily cumbersome, it's unnecessarily complicated. In fact, there are only two chapters in church history. You have the pre-Constantinian chapter and the post-Constantinian chapter. In other words, Christianity before Constantine the Great's conversion to Christianity, and then Christianity after Constantine's conversion. In other words, from the apostolic period up to AD 312, and then from AD 312 to the present, that's it. That's it, you wanna talk about church history, you talk about it in these two broad strokes. And there is more than a nugget of truth to this, this um, describing, this compartmentalizing of scripture, There's, or of history. There's something to this, and I wanna talk about it. What they mean primarily is that since Constantine, the church has had a confused but often very cozy relationship with what? With the state, and you can see how that would happen. Constantine the Great, the first Roman emperor to profess Christianity, is himself, of course, the emperor of Rome. He becomes a Christian. Now you have within the very, incarnationally, within the person of Constantine, you have a joining of church and state. He then sets a, 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 a trajectory of how church will relate to state. And you might recall 
that uh, I'll come to a quotation in just a second that I was alluding to. This slide comes first. In the post-Constantinian chapter of church, of church history, that means a bunch of stuff. And here's just some of the implications of a religion that is now no longer a persecuted minority, but a persecuting majority, okay? There are several things that follow in a post-Constantinian version of Christianity. Number one, the, the church moves from the Christian church of convinced believers to what is called Christendom. Christendom. Now you'll notice that D-O-M is kind of like kingdom. You now have a, the principle of a state, the principle of an empire, the principle of a kingdom, but it's wrapped up with the Christian church, or at least ostensibly wrapped up with the Christian church. So we transition from I am a Christian in the Roman Empire to what would later be called the Holy Roman Empire, Christendom. That's a transition. We transition from persecuted to persecutor. In the pre-Constantinian chapter, there's persecution, two primary persecutions, but there were others. And now the church becomes the persecutor, as we have described just a moment ago with Felix Mance, who was himself persecuted, in this case, by the Protestants. But there are many millions that were persecuted throughout the medieval period. We move from conversion to coercion, right? Not that I am a convinced believer and so now I convert to that line of thinking, but I am born in to Christendom. I am now a member of a Christian nation, a Christian country. I have a Christian magistrate. Christianity is now less about what you think and believe and more about who you are culturally, geographically, and socially. Number four, we move from the power of the spirit to the power of the state, okay? from believer's baptism to infant baptism, which was Felix Mant's great sin. Now, to try and set it in its historical context, the reason that rebaptism was considered so dangerous and so egregious, a punishment worthy of death, was that it seemed to undermine the great truth of, of a Christian magistrate or a Christian state, right? So, so just to recapitulate something I said a moment ago, it's easier to come out of Rome than it is to have Rome come out of you. That is an ongoing call that we encounter even as we get to the book of Revelation here in 2017. Come out of her, my people. Coming out of Babylon is easier than having Babylon come out of you. And so there was this, this reorientation away from a convinced believer and toward a citizen of a state or of a nation and you are baptized into that identity. And then finally from convinced to citizen. That's the Constantinian shift. Shifting from the power of the spirit, morphing into the power of the state. And so there are historians and scholars and others who look at the shape of Christianity and they say, since the time of Constantine, the Christian church has never been a persecuted minority on the whole on earth. This is now the post-Constantinian world. The Christians tend to be in power. And in the name of Christianity, they go colonize, or should we say conquer other lands in the name of Jesus, post-Constantinian. Let's talk now about the religion of human nature, and this is the, the, this and the, the second and the fourth elements that we're gonna talk about will be the ones that will probably be the, the closest, will, will strike us right at the closest. We're gonna move from historical and sort of theoretical to, to personal and experiential. In Luke chapter nine, verses 51 to 55, it says, now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, this is Jesus, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and he sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans. Now some of you know where this story is going. It's fascinating. To prepare for, to prepare for him, so they go ahead. But they did not receive Jesus because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. For some reason they were offended that he wasn't gonna stay for a long time. Hey, I'm on my way to Jerusalem and they were offended at it. When his disciples, James and John, saw this offense, they said, hey Lord, we can sort this out. Do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them like Elijah did. I mean, you do not have to be in a Romish environment, you don't have to be in 1517 or 1527 or, or 1054 to have this as a basic fundamental part of human nature. In the apostolic period, the answer seemed pretty self-evident. Those people have rejected the Messiah. Lord, we can sort this out and we'll do it with violence. We will call down, I mean, isn't that an endorsement in the Old Testament? Isn't that essentially what happened with Elijah? They have, it appears, a biblical justification for their desire. Jesus' response is unambiguous and unmistakable. 
He does not mince words, but he rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. The idea that you would coerce, that you would, on penalty of death or penalty of pain or of other, other persecutorial forms, that you would force somebody into belief. He said, you don't know what spirit you're of, but it's not this spirit. Let me tell you, the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Can you say amen? amen. So you don't need to be a, a freshly hatched Protestant. You don't need to be an entrenched papist in order to think, you know what? Those people disagree with me. We will deal with them with violence if need be, with death if need be. This is a part of human nature, carnal human nature. Matthew chapter 26, this is the arrest of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him with violence. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the priest and cut off his ear. Okay, he wasn't aiming for the ear. <laughs> it's not as though he was, you know, a, a, a very crafty swordsman and he's like, you know what, I'm gonna send a message here. I'm gonna sever his ear. Tell him to back up, uh, get out of our grill, back off. No, 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 he's aiming for the head, but he's a fisherman. He's like, oh, my ear! Cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place. And then this axiomatic, a statement that has been borne out through the, 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 the bloody annals of history, this statement that in its essence is, is the, 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 in fact, this statement will be quoted later in Revelation, Revelation chapter 13. All who take the sword will perish by the sword. If you open up the Pandora's box of violence, it will consume you, All right? Violence begets violence, and there is no sense in which a violent end, and, you know, despite what the, you know, the James Bond movies say, despite what the superhero movies say, despite what all of these, you know, movies and novels and other things that de depict what's called the myth of redemptive violence, the idea that the bad guys have weapons, the bad guys have guns, but if we can just get similarly strong weapons into the good guy's hand, then the good will prevail. Jesus says it doesn't work like that. Violence itself turns the good guys into bad guys. A few years ago, I watched a movie that was fascinating and really challenging. It's called The Machine Gun Preacher. Anybody here seen that movie? Was that challenging? It's about a man, it's, a, it's set in modern times, a true story about a guy who went and traveled to one of the countries in Africa that I don't, or Sudan. Went to Sudan, and he went down there just to help, and he began to see the, the needs there, and he went largely initially as sort of a humanitarian, you know, he's going down to help people and with schools and with children, and he, he was like a, like a Harley Davidson bike rider kind of a guy, an American guy, and he just, his heart was moved, he got converted, and he went to Sudan, and he, he tried to do some work on these mission trips, but then he, he saw a situation that changed the trajectory of his ministry. Some raiders came in and just devastated a village and kidnapped a bunch of the kids. And he's like, whoa, 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 what's that? that's not gonna, so they did what seemed to be the very American thing to do. He got guns. Shh, shh, just come back. Well, they found it was difficult to know exactly when they were gonna come back, and sometimes when they were away, the marauders would come, and so the next step is, well, if we can't prevent them, we don't know when they're coming, and our defensive posture isn't working, we'll take it to them. So he went and got bigger guns and he started hunting down to find the people that were gonna come and you know, uh, kidnap these children that he was trying to protect. And, and the, the, the whole crux of the movie, the whole punchline of the movie is at the end, this, this lady's like, no, 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 we can't do that. And she says to him, can you not see that you have become what you are warring against? That's Jesus' point here. Something about violence drags the whole equation down to its lowest common denominator. Put your sword away. And then Jesus says, do you not think that I could right now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Right, don't you think that I could do that? What's fascinating about that is that Jesus says, there is a violent out for me. I could exercise force, I could exercise violence right now and extricate myself from this situation but something bigger and better and actually in the long term more effective than violence is taking place. Put your sword away. If you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. 
Notice this in a fascinating article titled Romanism, the Religion of Human Nature. Ellen White says these words, one of the founders of the Adventist church, and I'm gonna quote her here. This is fascinating, not as some sort of ecclesiastical or prophetic authority. I'm gonna quote her as simply exercising basic common sense. Okay, you tell me what you think. The claim of the papacy to superiority is made under the influence of the first great usurper who so persistently urged his right to supremacy over the host of God. Notice supremacy. Protestantism is incapable in its essence of union with Romanism, but must be as far separated from, what are the next two words? From the principles of the papacy as the East is from the West. And then this sentence, Popery is the religion of human nature. If you took the inbuilt human desire, the inbuilt human nature, and you institutionalized it, if you, ecclesiastical, if you made it an ecclesiastical structure, you would get, she says, popery. A man at the top. That is simply a, a, an echo in the reverb chamber of the first desire to to be over and supreme, to go beyond a sphere of influence, and that goes back to Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, and the Luciferian rebellion. This is inbuilt into who we are. You don't need to be a Dark Ages medieval papist to advocate this idea. We saw that James and John moments ago were like, hey, we know how to solve this problem. Violence will solve this. Here are just some of those principles of human nature. I am right, you are wrong. You with me? I am right, that's an elevation. I occupy the high ground. I am above you educationally, academically, morally, scripturally. I am right, you are wrong, right? We feel pretty good about being right, don't we? Do we feel similarly good about being righteous? Jesus takes the righteous path, we often take the right path. I am right. I know a variety of propositional scriptural truths and I can set you straight. And let's be honest, much of our evangelistic enterprise, including my own ministry at times, especially in my early years, was largely predicated on the idea that people are basically wrong about life, they're wrong about death, they're wrong about God, they're wrong about the day of worship, they're wrong about what you can and can't eat, they're basically wrong, and I felt that at some level my responsibility was to go and tell them they're wrong and I'm right. And not just that I'm right, but my church is right. There's a whole bunch of us over here that are right, and you should come be a part of us because we're right. You know what's interesting? We had conversions. In some cases, lots of conversions. But the kinds of people that we would often, not always, there were some amazing people that were converted in those years, but often the people that would be converted were people that were stubborn and self-righteous and wanted to be right just like us. Number two, exclusivity and heresy. That's a principle. The idea of exclusivity, we will return to that at the end, but I wanna just br dwell briefly here on this idea of heresy. Does anybody know what the word heresy means? Choice. It means choice. The word means choice. Now let's just try and put that in its historical context. We have in the developing Christian faith, right, especially in the post-Constantinian era, in the pre-Constantinian era as well, we have what, what scholars refer to as the Catholic Church. Now don't confuse that with the Roman Catholic Church. In this sense, the word Catholic just means the universal church, right? There were not a bunch of denominationalisms, you know, a, a bunch of denominated peoples, the Baptists, the Wesleyans, the Congregationalists, the Puritans, the Adventists, that wasn't the case. You had the Catholic Church, okay? Not only did you have the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church was also what's called Orthodox, Orthodoxy comes from the root word ortho, meaning straight, which is why an orthodontist straightens your teeth and you put orthopedics in your shoes so that you will walk straight. Orthodox means straight, Catholic means universal. So if you have a church that everybody believes and what we believe is right and straight, well you can understand how anybody who provides an option or an alternative or a choice is dangerous. They're heretics. They're providers of a choice. When we set up these bulwarks of absolute certainty that we are right, we get nervous when people start making choices that are different from the party line. You with me? Hey, wait, wait that's not, he or she has stepped outside of, of the Orthodox Catholic Church. By the way, no denomination is immune to this. 
Okay, my denomination is not immune to this thinking. The Baptists are not immune to this thinking. The Presbyterians are not immune to this thinking. The Catholics are not immune to this thinking. And apparently James and John were not immune to it either. I'll come to that in just a second. Number three, I am better than you, I am above you. That's the whole concept of supremacy. Okay, as if knowledge or theological awareness somehow gives me a moral or ontological superiority over you. That was the conversation, we'll get to this in a moment, but I'll just preempt it. That was the conversation that was being had when nobody was willing to wash the feet because that was a, that was a prima facie admission that I'm under you. So if nobody's willing to go to the under position. So Jesus does it and everybody's absolutely, they, they don't know what to do. How can the highest become the lowest? See, our posture is to be above, it's to be greater, it's to be more, it's to be right, it's to be better. And then finally, number four, I will make you agree with me because dissent is not permissible. Whether by manipulation or by force or by coercion, I will do my very best to make you see what I see. Those are some of the principles. Now, we quoted a moment ago from Luke chapter nine where, where the disciples have come into the city with Jesus of Samaria and you know, they've resisted him because his face was set to Jerusalem and their response is, hey, we'll burn the city up. What I want you to see is fascinating here. I want you to see the flow of, of Luke chapter nine. We could study this right through, but I'm just gonna sort of truncate it here so you can see why this is so significant. Okay, so in, G, in, in Luke chapter nine, Jesus foretells his death. This is the first time in the Gospel of Luke. It's, it's the, it's the um, counterpart of Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus says, who do people say that I am? Some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, some say you're one of the prophets. Who do you say I am? You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. That sentence. It's at that point in the Gospel of Matthew, at that very point, that Jesus then says, you know who I am, you know why I, you know who I am, and now I'm gonna tell you why I am. And it's from that point that he begins to say, I will be crucified, I will be rejected, I will die. And they're like, no, no, that's the point. That's Luke 9, that's right here. This is Jesus foretelling his death. Then, astonishingly, he invites others to take up a Roman instrument of torture, to take up their cross. Now just don't think anachronistically here. Put yourself into the story. The cross is not yet good news. The cross at this point in history is a, is, is a symbol, the symbol of Roman power and cruelty. So for Jesus to say, take up your cross, is like speaking in riddles. It, in, not even riddles, it's speaking in, in hogwash. It does not make any sense. Take up your cross. We'll be taking up crosses, and we'll be putting some people on those crosses, Jesus. We see what you mean. We see what you mean. <laughs> Just so as there would be no doubt about who Jesus is, because you can't have a dying Messiah, this miraculous transformation takes place on the mount when they see Jesus there, uh, Peter, James, and John see Jesus with Moses and Elijah, so they're like, and th this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The message here is that you will be tempted, you will be sorely tempted to wonder whether or not this guy really is the Messiah when you see him ha hanging on the cross, but this is the guy. So there's this like solidification of Jesus' identity. Now watch where this goes. Number four, the next thing that Jesus does is he heals a boy and it's just one of the most tragic, difficult to read stories in the New Testament. It's the story about the boy who's foaming at the mouth and he throws himself into the fire and the father comes and says, ah, in exasperation, I don't know what to do, I, I need your help. And here's this picture, this portrait of Messiah, right up against, or just right up against where the disciples are gonna be like, hey, you want us to burn down that city? Here's Jesus, tender Jesus, healing, ministering to, coming down to the lowest, most pitiable, most pathetic of human situations, and injecting himself with healing and wholeness and help into those situations. This is who Messiah is. This is what Messiah is. He's not here to kill, he's here to heal. Jesus again foretells his death, he sets them up, and then we get here. Then we get right here, these three points right in a row. All of this in Luke 9 is a setup for these three events. The argument about who is the greatest, the religion of human nature. I am the great, no, I, no, I, and each are making their case as to why they would be, I was called first. Well, I was, I sleep closer to him. Well, I'm the one that, you know, whatever the, the it, that would have been a funny conversation to have heard. Then this, the disciples forbid a preacher healing in Jesus' name. We'll come to that in just a second. And then finally, the one that we've already mentioned, a Samaritan village rejects Jesus and the disciples offer to bring fire down. So let's read that. 
Then a dispute arose among them. Let's read that passage. Then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be the greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child and set him by him and said to them, this is how it works, fellas. Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he that is least among you will be great. So this is not greatness by, gr this is not greatness by being the greatest. This is greatness by being the least by being the most humble, by being the servant, by acquiescing and helping others. He continues, now John answered and said, Master, we got, a, we got a story to tell you. This is the very next section. Oh, you're not gonna believe what we saw today, Jesus. We have a story to tell you. We saw someone casting out demons in your name and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. They, they, you, the, the whole flow of this, this little interaction here gives you the strong sense that the disciples are expecting a congratulations. <laughs> well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs> Did you find any other heretics that you were able to forbade? <laughs> Carry on. By all means, establish clear boundaries between us and them. Ah, oh, but look at Jesus' response. Jesus said to him, he's always saying the thing you don't expect. Put your sword away. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. Give to him that has lots and take away from him that has nothing. What? What? Who? what? Do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. Now check this out. John said, Master, we saw a man. This is another translation. I love this translation. John said, Master, we saw a man using your name to force demons out of people, but we tried to stop him because he isn't one of us. Yeah, we did our best to stop him, but he was so stubborn, we couldn't catch him. I was, I was gassed, but he got away. <laughs> it makes you wonder what they would have done. I remember a story years ago. A friend of mine was in a, uh, in a, in a country, and, and uh, he had a camera on his arm, and the camera was, somebody came up and ripped the camera off of his arm and started running. And then he's like, what, you can't, you can't take my camera? And he starts chasing, he's chasing this guy for a long time, and then he starts, he's chasing him for long enough to not start thinking about it, and he thinks, what am I gonna do when I catch him? <laughs> like, what is my plan? Hey, hey, could, could you give me that back? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> it makes you wonder, like, what, what, were the, what was the disciples' plan? Like, hey, uh, stop. <laughs> what? Stop that. No, I, Jesus is amazing. I'm talking, I'm telling, I just healed this guy and these thing, amazing things are happening in the name of Jesus. Yeah, but, but stop it or come with us. Now, this is really key. Check this out. The disciples can imagine only two possible options. This is really simple, really easy. You are either with us and Jesus or you are not with us and Jesus. Right? Is that right? They can't conceive of a third option and Jesus introduces them to a radical third option. He says, no, there is a third option here. He can be with me, but not with you. <laughs> can you say amen? amen? That guy can be with me, but not with you. Let that settle in. Because we too can have this identical posture. You join us. You join my church, you join my denomination, you join me, and if you don't, then you are not with Jesus. Jesus is like, no. They can be with me, but not necessarily with you. Now, control versus freedom. We mentioned this quotation before. This is from the Catholic historian Carlos Ayer in his new book, Reformations, The Early Modern World. The Inquisition is that essential, what are the next three words? Agent of control. In the Catholic Church, he's describing the medieval Inquisition, primarily the Spanish Inquisition. He says the Inquisition became an important aspect of the Catholic Reformation. Among Protestants, the institutions, uh, institution assumed a monstrous and menacing character as the embodiment of all that was wrong with the church in Rome. But when all is said and done, like its Protestant counterparts, I skipped over that the first time I read it on the opening night. I skipped over that because we think Inquisition, that's a Catholic thing, and it's, it's all that's wrong and monstrous and menacing with the medieval Catholic Church. But we just read a moment ago in 1527 that Felix Mance was drowned by being tied to a pole by Protestants. 
an inquisition, an inquiry. Are you a part of the Catholic Orthodox Church? Or are you providing an alternative? Are you providing an option? Continues. Like its Protestant counterparts, the Inquisition did suppress and punish, as well as stifle free expression. Zero tolerance for freedom of expression was the rule. How does that sit with you? How does that line sit with you? Zero tolerance for freedom of expression as a rule. You, you, you good with that? You feel good about that? No, of course you're not. You, you, it, it just, it goes against the very fiber and fabric of our being and of all beings. This is why the Constitution would open with those words, we hold these truths to be self-evident. This is obvious. That all men are, are created to, to, with freedom and life and life. I'm just gonna massacre it here, but you get the idea. <laughs> Zero tolerance for freedom of expression was the rule rather than the exception throughout Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. The same could be said for cruelty, which all too often trumped compassion. We may wish it had been different, but unfortunately wishful thinking is irrelevant in history. Now let's talk about that idea of the Inquisition. We, we made this point, and I want to really press it home today. In general, the Protestant Reformation, as they were coming out of darkness into light, the light of the gospel, the light of scripture, the light of sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, in general, the Protestant Reformation emphasized the gospel and freedom, while the Catholic reformer response at the Council of Trent emphasized the church and control. So they doubled down. Now the Protestants were only just just burgeoningly, just slowly, just, just, just incrementally coming into the light of the gospel. But as Luther and Zwingli and others like him began to come into it, they, they only slowly shed some of their Roman attachments and some of their Roman, uh, Roman leanings. But the emphasis was freedom. And the question we're asking this morning is, what would a church look like that kept going, that didn't set up a bulwark, didn't set up a standard around a person or around an event. What would that look like? Such was the essence of Catholic reform aimed at the laity as summed up in a single Tridentine decree. Tridentine means post Council of Trent. And here it is. Worship uniformly, instruct thoroughly, and police intensely. I wanna think about each of these. When it came time to respond to the, the reformers and their emphasis on Jesus and faith and scripture and grace, the response was, well, well how, this could get out of control. Who's in charge? I mean, we, we can't have people doing what they think is right. Who are they answerable to? And of course, the response, well, God, is in, that's inadequate. No, there has to be a hierarchy. There has to be an organization. There has to be, no, they have to be answerable to somebody on earth. So what we're going to do is we're going to worship uniformly. There will be nobody stepping outside of the way that we all worship. This is the Council of Trent response. Does that in any way find a resonance with your community of faith? Whatever your community of faith is here today, because we have a lot of Adventists and we have a lot of non-Adventists that watch and we have people of various stripes. I'm gonna talk about one of them here in just a moment. Is there a push? Is there, a, is there an undertone in your community of faith that if you are not worshiping like everyone else, you're doing something wrong? You're doing something liberal. You're doing something heretical. You need to come in line. Is it realistic as a global entity, and the Christian church is certainly a global church, and as a personal member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has the unique blessing and privilege of also being a global church. Is it realistic to think that somebody raised in the culture and, and, and conduct and situation, say, in Nicaragua, would find the way that they worship and conduct themselves and carry themselves in, in Ukraine to be strange? The food would be strange, the architecture would be strange, the clothing would be strange. They would have their own idiosyncratic way of doing life. God did not call the Christian church to turn everyone into Westerners. He said make disciples. And if we know anything about God based on what we know about genetic variants, I mean just look around, God seems to really value variety. 
There are 10,000 plus species of birds, some 5,000 species of mammals, 750,000 species of insects. Do I need to go on? I mean, it's like, why is there this inbuilt variability and flexity in, in, in the, the way that genetic information is passed on? Because apparently and absolutely God values variety. And if a culture, as long as they're not doing something that's in direct violation of God's holy word, has its own wonderful, who here likes to travel? Why? <laughs> the answer is so obvious that it's like, what do you mean, why? I want to see other peoples, I want to smell other smells, I want to taste other foods, I want to go into other buildings. If you value variety, you think God wants a homogenous, absolute, everybody has to be the same, look the same, sing the same, act the same, speak the same, dress the same. Friends, that was the Tridentine wake. We will worship uniformly. There will be no variance. Any variance will be summarily punished. We talked about, but some of you may not have been here, but we talked about Vatican II, which is the more modern, uh, one of the more modern councils that have taken place in Catholicism, in fact, the last major ecclesiastical council, and there was huge debate about this. You ready, you ready? Huge debate about this. This was one of the major shifts. The priest had historically faced away from the congregation while performing the mass. And after years of debate, and taking various arguments from each side, it was decided that it was permissible and better, in this context, for the priests to face the congregation. Amen, ego te absolvo, hamana shamana, hamana shamana, hum. <laughs> because, because, and there are today in the Catholic communion, there are people that resist Vatican II. They say Latin, the mass can only be in Latin. The priest has to face away and we need the or, more ornate vestments. There are people that say, hey, we don't like this. But the idea that, well, you know, just kind of stand how you want to stand. What? Heretic. And in our own Protestant communities of faith, I would imagine that you could point to some instances and some situations where we have this sort of sense that if you're doing it different from us, you're doing it wrong. No variability, no flexibility. No, 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 it has to be uniform, number one. Number two, instruct thoroughly. Nothing wrong with that. I got no issue with that, as long as we are instructing from Scripture. How about this one, though? Police intensely. Of course, you have to police, because control is at odds with human nature. You know, so I, I want to wear a, a bow tie. Tie did not wear a tie, which to me is like an internal contradiction. It was a contradictory message this morning that he was sending. <laughs> tie without a tie, and he had the audacity to wear a suit. Did you notice that? A suit without a tie, by tie, it's just absurd. <laughs> now, Jeffrey will come out this evening, and he will wear a tie with no jacket, <laughs> but not a bow tie, a long tie, right? And, 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 okay, knock yourself out. Right? Now, this is just a silly little example, but the point is, is that if we're going to police, the idea is if there's not uniformity, we have to have people that will squelch freedom of expression wherever we find it. Police intensely? Are you comfortable with this? I mean, yeah, like wh when your children are three years old and they go to somebody's house that has like all of those little gnome trinkets or, you know, uh, porcelain and pewter things, you got like, hey, I gotta police my children intensely, but adults? Adults who can themselves go to scripture and read and say, well, my conviction is this. Well, your conviction is wrong. <laughs> because my conviction is this. Are you with me? Yeah. Freedom is scary, it's dangerous. Finally, a mighty movement or mere denominationalism. Let's bring this down, let's, let's let this sit right in, in our lap today, right in our local situation. Some of this, some of you, this might not mean anything to some of you, but this, this is a beautiful thing right here on the screen. <laughs> How many of you were with us at camp meeting last year? Convocation last year? Raise your hands. Okay, you might remember in, in one of the, I think it was the opening presentation, Ty was going off on some weird illustration and he started talking about a sandwich. And the sandwich that he talked about was, and he went into great detail, it took like half of our time, he went into great detail <laughs> 
about how to toast the bread and how the peanut butter has to be spread, not too much, not too little, and how the blueberries, which you can barely see, have to be placed so that every single bite has at least one or one and a half blueberries. Like he went into detail. You then take the blueberries and you put bananas over the top of the blueberries and then I think there was a little salt and a little, maybe a little olive oil underneath all of this contraption. I didn't make this. And then you drizzle it with chocolate. And, and if I recall right, James, Fred, and Je Jeffrey and myself were like, that sounds terrible. <laughs> it actually looks fairly good right now since I didn't eat breakfast, but, <laughs> but this sandwich, this sandwich right here was made by these two people. I wanna tell you about Jerry and Dinica. I met Jerry and Dinica last year when I was at a camp meeting, a Seventh-day Adventist camp meeting. And after I had finished preaching a message, I didn't know them before, they came up to me and they said, hey, uh, could, could we talk to you, David? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to talk to you. Hey, and there, there's sort of this hush about them. Said, hey, uh, we're not Seventh-day Adventists. Is it okay if we're here? <laughs> I'm like, security! <laughs> hey, police intensely, right? I'm like, of course, what do you mean is it okay? I'm like, tell me your stories. So they take Violetta and I out to this amazing French uh, 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 diner that's like you know, 20 minutes away from where we were and we just had the most lovely meal and they tell me their story. Raised, born in Holland and raised in a strong Dutch reformed church. Strong Dutch reformed church. Calvinistic church, what Ty talked about this morning, raised in that environment. They, by their words, I, they know I'm telling this story, they were raised in what they would call a very legalistic environment. And it was funny, as they were going through some of the elements of legalism, I was like, are, are, you were raised what? Because I half expected them to say my faith. But they're like, no, we were Dutch Reformed. So I'm just listening and I'm like, wow, the similarities are astonishing, but they go on. Well, Dinica ends up listening to an American evangelist preaching on, on television and she, hears about a personal relationship with Jesus. And her heart begins to warm and to melt because she's, she's seeing that a mere formalism, a mere religiosity, even though it has sound doctrine, is just not satisfying the deepest longings of her heart. And so she listens in secret and then finally she begins to listen openly. And she comes home one day and she says to Jerry, Jerry, I want, I want to be baptized. She's in her 40s. He's like, heretic! Because <laughs> they had been baptized in the Dutch Reformed Church as infants. Well, Jerry was reluctant, reluctant, and then uh, through an amazing circumstance, he ended up with his back hurt, and he gets on the couch, and he couldn't move, and this was in the dark ages before remote controls, yeah. and... <laughs> Dinica went out to run an appointment and she turned on the channel that she knew the American evangelist would come on and the American evangelist came on and Jerry's like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so she couldn't bring herself to look, he couldn't bring himself to look at the television so with great effort he turned around and faced the back of the couch. <laughs> and as Dinica tells me the story, she comes home and her husband, in her words, was a, was a sobbing mess. He heard the gospel. They ended up going to a local Pentecostal church. Went there for 10 years. Baptized as believers, fell in love with Jesus, learned that it's more than doctrine and all of, all of the sort of traditions of a particular faith community and they just fell in love with Jesus. And then one day they were watching television and they found this thing called the Hope Channel. Amen. And they watched this thing called Table Talk. <laughs> and they were like, we'd never heard anything like that before and we, oh, J J uh, Dinica says, we just love you and Jeffrey and Ty, and we just love James, and we, oh, we just love you guys. <laughs> so then, I spend the rest of that camp meeting with them, we have a great time, and I say, hey, listen. They say, look, we, we've looked it up, and there's a local Seventh-day Adventist church in our town, we've listened to your convocation, we've read the great controversy, we love it. We believe what you believe. Light bearers is like our attachment. We Hope Channel's our favorite channel and all this. We go to this local, now they're going to a Baptist church. So about four months later, I get a letter about that long from Dinica. I think Ty received it as well. And it is 
One of those letters that I get occasionally and it's just impossibly difficult to read. We went to our local Seventh-day Adventist church. We went for three months. We did not hear the gospel one time. We heard a lot of stuff, but we didn't hear the gospel. And only a couple people were friendly to us. And we were made to feel as outsiders. And so we're going back to our Jesus preaching, friendly Baptist church. Now what do you think I said? What? Whoa, 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 whoa. You're going to a group of people that love Jesus and teach scripture and are friendly to you? No, you need to go to the place where they don't talk about Jesus and they're unfriendly to you because the right sign is on the building. Jerry and Denica lead out in a small group in their local church. Their favorite resources that they use in their small group, truth link study guides, <laughs> table talk, convocation. These people are not Seventh-day Adventists, but they are Seventh-day Adventists. Yeah. Are you hearing me? Yeah. We had dinner, they are just, uh, if, you, if you're interested on our Kingscliff YouTube channel, they just two Sabbaths ago were in my local church and I interviewed them and you can see they're so funny, they're so cute and they're giving this beautiful testimony and the church is just warming to it. You go to Kingscliff YouTube channel, you can watch it, it's the first 20 minutes of the sermon and you can, at one point in the testimony they say, we're not Seventh-day Adventists. And I was, there was that moment where you just wonder sort of how your church will respond and the church applauds. And I was like, hallelujah, <laughs> hallelujah. My, they were made to feel so, and they said to me, they ate with us, they said, man, we feel so warm. We wish this church was where we are. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. The gospel and the last day message of the gospel is for everybody. Amen. That's the Bible's way of saying it is for everybody. In the great controversy, according to scripture, according to this scripture, many of God's people must still be in Babylon. This is Babylon, come out of her, my people. And in what religious bodies are the greater part of the followers of Christ now to be found? Without doubt. Not quoting her as some sort of authority. I'm just quoting her as basic common sense. She gets it. I get it. I hope you get it. Without doubt in the various churches of the professing Protestant, professing Protestant faith. Where are the majority of Christ's followers? Oh, that's an easy one. Without a doubt, they're over there. There are many, she says, among the Catholics who live up to the light that they have far better than many who claim to believe pleasant, present truth. Many. Among the Catholics, there are many who are most conscientious Christians and who walk in all the light that God shines upon them, and God will work in their behalf. This is common sense. It does not require prophetic or ecclesiastical authority to just observe the world and say there are really great people all over the world. Amen. A great number will be saved from among the Catholics. It doesn't require prophetic authority to say that. It requires basic common sense. I'm just going to run through this statement. This is an amazing statement from Desire of Ages where she talks about among the heathen there are those who worship God ignorantly. These are the non-Christians, Catholic or Protestant, those to whom the light has never been brought by human instrumentality, yet they will not perish. Though ignorant, this is what Ty talked about last night, though ignorant of the written law of God, they have heard his voice speaking to them in nature. They have done the things that the law required. Their works are evidence that the Holy Spirit has touched their hearts and they are recognized as children of God. That covers everybody. If you've got Protestants, as the, without doubt, and then you've got Catholics where a great many will be saved and then you've got the heathen. That's all non-Christian religions. That's everybody. That is everybody. And Ty gave us this amazing, did you like this last night? The in who are out, in the visible church, there's the visible church. That's your, whatever your, your community of faith is. Or we could just say the whole Christian church, right? Whatever your community of faith is, and we could see it as the whole Christian, the, the in who are out, those that are in denominationally but are not in Christ. So these are unbelieving believers. Then you have the invisible church, the out who are in. These are believing unbelievers. People who believe, but they are themselves, they don't have doctrinal orthodoxy, or in some, they might not even be Christians. 
And then in the middle, you have the in who are in, and those are believing believers. What am I gonna say to Jerry and Dinica? And the thousands, and no, 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 no. Millions and millions of people just like them. You know what I'm gonna say to them? I'm gonna say, read scripture, follow Jesus, and stick with him. That's what I'm gonna say, that's what I'm gonna say. If they say to me, hey look, we would like to become a member of your local denominational community of faith, I'm gonna say, I would love to have you. And if they say, you know, we're gonna stay over here, but we believe what scripture teaches, I'm gonna say, more power to you. I'm not gonna forbade them. I don't wanna imagine only two realities. Either you're with me and Jesus, or you are not with me and Jesus, because Jesus might say to me, there's a third option. They can be with me, but not with you. It's an option. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. All right, justification by faith we talked about yesterday. Justification by his, God's faithfulness in Christ. I wanna leave you with 12 points. 12 points, okay? Rapid fire. Are we as the Christian church or in my own personal case, the Seventh-day Adventist, am um, am I a part of a movement or is it just a mere denomination? The root word of denomination is name. Is it just another name? Well, how can we become a movement and leave behind the, shed the skin of a mere denominationalism, a mere institutionalism? I'm gonna give you 12 things to do. Number one, believe the best about them. Love believes all things, hopes all things. So assume the best about every person you meet. Assume the best. They might be covered in tattoos. They might reek of smoke. Believe the best about them. They might have a a, a nose ring. They might have a pink mohawk. They might be riding a Harley Davidson. They might have a hijab on their head. Believe the best about them because everybody's on a journey that only God knows. Start there. Start by believing the best. Rather than an attitude or a posture of suspicion, have an attitude or a posture of, of assuming the best. Number two, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which Ty took us through last night, no longer regard anyone according to the flesh. Don't look at the outward and think you're judging the inward. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. When all the sons of Jesse were brought before the prophet Samuel, it's like, no, 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 no. They could, well, wait, there, there are no more. Oh, wait, there is that runt. <laughs> Number three, a riveted focus on God's faithfulness in Christ, not my faithfulness or your faithfulness. God's faithfulness in Christ Rather than the sun going around the earth in a geocentric reality, how about the earth going around the sun in a heliocentric reality where we are not the great story. Jesus is the great story. Number four, build bridges, not walls. I said this the other day, but I want to say it again. Walls build themselves, but bridges take effort. To build a bridge with somebody who's not your faith or who is of no faith or not your denomination or to build, it takes energy, it takes effort. You have to find those points on which you can agree. The model for this is in Acts chapter 17 with Paul and the, the, the Athenian philosophers. Learn to build bridges rather than walls. The walls will build themselves. They don't need your help. Number five, how about trying a posture of inclusivity rather than exclusivity? Talk about us and not just them. In the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, they were like, man, what are we gonna do with all these Gentile peoples who are coming into the the Jewish reality of a Jewish Messiah based on Jewish scriptures? And Peter said his part, and, and Paul said his part, and finally James is like, well, this is what I think. I think we should not put any obstacle in the way of the Gentiles who are turning to faith. Let's make it as easy as possible. Life is hard enough without the Christian church making it harder still. Think about Jesus. Do you think that Jesus made most people's lives harder or easier? Number six, less institutionalism and more passionate biblical proclamation. In my own community of faith, I can say that I think we spend too much energy, too much time on well-defining our institutional parameters and membership and all of that. I think we should just go preach the gospel. Just preach the gospel and let the chips fall where they may. I'm not saying we totally leave institutionalism. Of course, there has to be some organization, but our orientation should be to proclamation, not to institution. Because of this reality called institutional drift, as you begin to grow, and this is true of all institutions, as your institution gets larger and larger and larger, and now you have have systems that sustain the institution, you, you, you get to the place where you're like, we have to keep the institution going, and you turn away from mission, whether it's making widgets or preaching the gospel, 
And good leadership in these large uh, entities, whether Facebook or Google or the Seventh-day Adventist Church or the Christian Church, it requires leadership to say, hey, we're not here to build buildings. We're not here to build an institution. We're here to make disciples and to preach the gospel. This serves that. We don't serve this. Institutionalism. Number seven. Understand cultural idiosyncrasies versus core biblical imperatives. We are going to stand on thus saith the Lord in my community of faith. That's, one, that's the reason I am a Seventh-day Adventist because I am persuaded, roundly persuaded that this is what scripture teaches. But I need to be aware now that I've got 21 years with this community of faith that there are idiosyncratic things that they do that some of them think are actually the truth with a capital T when in fact that's just the way you do it. That's your own idiosyncratic way of doing it. I don't think Jesus cares if, if, any, if, if, if everyone doesn't sing Onward Christian Soldiers, even though it's a great song. I don't think he cares if we sit in buildings that have uh, steeples on them. I don't think he cares if we sit in pews or wear bow ties. But I think he is deeply passionate that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and we love our neighbors as ourselves. We have to learn to differentiate between our own cultural ways of doing things and core biblical imperatives. We need to keep the big picture big and the small picture small. We major in the majors and we minor in the minors. Can you say amen to that? Amen. We don't want to minor in the majors and we don't want to major in the minors. Number nine, we need to preach Christ way more than antichrist. Amen. Come on. I love that quotation that Ty read us there when we had our interactive Bible study. Many of you are not here, but there's this great little statement from one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Ellen White, where she says, as we get closer to the end of time, we may have less and less to say about the Roman power. Well, why? Because we'll have more and more to say about Jesus. Yeah. Number 10, we must resist all forms of spiritual coercion and manipulation, whether the hard version or the softer versions. We're not gonna be tying people to poles and chucking them into rivers. Can you say amen? But we don't want to manipulate people in other ways either, the softer versions of coercion and manipulation. We, if Jesus doesn't use co coercion, why do we think we would be privileged to use coercion? We're not. A man convinced against his will is... Of the same opinion. Last two. We need to think, this is how we need to think. Think biblical, end time, welcoming, reformational movement, not cloistered and exclusive denominationalism. Notice the operative words here, welcoming, end time, movement, not a cloistered denominationalism, okay? There are many ways to gauge this in your local church. If your local church does not have regularly visitors, pe visitors, people visiting who are not members of your faith or of any faith, you're doing church wrong. Just to, just to put the finest point possible on it, if your local church does not regularly, consistently have visitors coming, you're not doing church right. Just trust me on that, you're not. Because people were attracted to Jesus. He didn't have to put up any advertisements or send out any handbills, they just came. And if people are not attracted to our church, we're doing it wrong. We're monkish, we're basically little monasteries. People, the, the doors need to be open and we need to create an ambience, a feel, a, 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 a sense that everybody is welcome here. Amen. Doesn't matter what they're wearing. Amen. Doesn't matter if they have rings in their nose or they reek of smoke. I have a dear sister in my local church. Comes on Sabbath mornings, sneaks away into the bathroom and smokes. And I got some of my saints coming up saying, hey, the bathroom smells like smoke. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's because Beth is in there. So I have to have a talk with Beth, and I'm like, Beth, here's the deal. You don't have to smoke in the bathroom. Just smoke in the parking lot. I don't care. Just, <laughs> just smoke right here in the, it does not bother. Just smoke. Don't go in there. You don't have to go in there. We love you. You just smoke right out here. And I had to tell my elders, hey, we want smokers in our church. Amen. And they're like, yeah, you're I think you're right. <laughs> Number 12, if you forget everything else I said, just remember this, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Amen. Keep that straight. If Jesus is for everyone, then the church should be for everyone. Amen. Why not? Amen. Why not? 
Friends, the ecclesiastical trajectory of reform, as the church grows in the vein of the reformers, it's not to arrive at an institutional end. It's to keep growing, it's to keep welcoming, it's to keep preaching, it's to invite people as Jesus did, come unto me, all you who are heavy or all you are weary who are, and who are heavy laden, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The invitation is to come to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, we come this morning. And Lord, at times we have been really good at inviting people. And at times we have exercised an exclusivity and an unwelcoming spirit. And Father, that's not the worst. People have thought that our actions reflected on our Jesus. And that's the real sadness. Not that people were jerks, but that people thought God was a jerk. Father, forgive us. Forgive us where we have been less than you have called us to be. Forgive us where we have built walls and not bridges. Forgive us where we have not been faithful to our core mission, which is to make disciples and to teach and preach. Forgive us, Father, where we have been less than welcoming. How would we treat the Samaritan at the well, the centurion with the sick servant? How would we treat the tax collector or the prostitute? Father, I know that some of our churches would be welcoming and would be everything that Jesus was, but I fear that others would be less so. And I pray today, Father, that each of us would take individual ownership, not to say the church as if we're talking about some entity over there, but to say I am the church. I'm not going to complain about the church. I'm going to change the church because I am the church. I am the body of Christ. Father, forgive us where we have fallen short. We fall at your feet and we ask for forgiveness and teach us how to do church in the 21st century where the world is becoming more secular, more sensual, more hostile to faith. Teach us how to occupy that niche where we are inviting and we stand firm for truth, but we are not jerks. And we are not driving people away from the very Jesus who said, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Let everyone say,